All right, well, for our series on prayer, I know a good way to start it. We will say a prayer. Father, I thank you so much for today, and I just pray that you will uh, be glorified through our study, even as Jesus' disciples asked him in, in Luke chapter 11. We ask that you will teach us to pray. We thank you so much for this honor and privilege we have that is called prayer. And prayer is us uh, speaking to you, communicating with you, and I do pray that you will uh, be glorified through our study and just help us to understand so many new things as we as we go through this. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've sort of started having a kind of an emphasis at High Point on prayer. We had a, a prayer meeting. We're going to try to make those a little more regular. We are, uh, you know, just getting really excited about what God might do and recognizing that God does a lot of things in the world in response to prayer. God, who is sovereign and in control, he delights in working in our lives through prayer because God is relational. And uh, the reason he created us is he wanted to have a relationship with us. And part of that relationship is prayer. So prayer, well, traditionally prayer has been described as talking to God, which it is. The, the, the old English word prayer actually means entreaty or asking God for something, which is a lot of what we do in prayer. So it might actually be more of a subcategory of talking to God. However, I'm perfectly fine with just talking to God, calling prayer, talking to God, as long as we understand that our prayer should be characterized by a little more than just uh, requests, but should also include things like praise and, and other things. But... Tonight, what I want to talk about is I just want to talk about the, the, the biblical model for prayer. Uh, there's kind of a, uh, shall we say, almost a template, biblically, for how we should pray. It doesn't mean that it's, it's something that if we do something a little different, it's wrong, but that the Bible tells us a lot about how we should pray. And I want to put this in a little bit of a context for you. So I want to review something we talked about, oh, many months ago now which was the doctrine of the Trinity. As Christians, we believe that God is Trinity. We have one God. He exists eternally in three distinct persons who are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And one of the important things we understand about the Trinity is it's not just a doctrine. Because it's who God is. I mean, imagine, imagine if Andrea had like a maybe let's say let's say she had even like a 50 page description of who i am if you asked her about her husband and you you'd never met me and she started telling you some facts about me well let's say those pages were all she had right there's no me or maybe i'm lost in the jungle or something but but it doesn't matter she has these 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 set of facts that wouldn't be a relationship that would be knowing facts god as trinity calls us to be in a relationship with himself. And so our doctrine of the Trinity very much uh, relates to prayer. A um, couple of things prayer has been called. This isn't a theological definition, but it's just a way of, of, of discussing it. Uh, Dr. David Jeremiah, he's a local Bible teacher. You may have heard of him, pastor at Shadow Mountain Community Church. He has a book on prayer, a very good book, and it's called Prayer, the Great Adventure. And he's talking about that because when you start to pray and you start to see God answer, you're like, what is God going to do? Um, I would prefer to call prayer, and this is not an either or, it's different things, but if I were to write a book on prayer, which, who knows, maybe someday I will, I might call it something like the great invitation. Because God invites us to pray and he invites us to commune with him to know him more deeply through prayer as well as have our prayers answered and i'm going to tell you a kind of a general way that the bible calls us to pray and i want to talk about why it's important and then talk through some scripture we're going to talk as we go through this study we're going to talk about so many different aspects of prayer we're going to talk about asking god for things we're going to talk about promises god makes related to prayer we're going to talk about hindrances and hindrances is a way of saying when people's prayers aren't being answered why aren't they the bible actually tells us quite a bit about things that can hinder prayer oh uh, we're going to talk about why it's important to pray we're going to talk about about some of the things the bible calls us to pray about so that this is going to be 
an extensive study, probably at least as long as our study of salvation, because the Bible tells us so much about prayer. And I just really wanted to take some time with this, because as we're getting to know God through these studies, it's so important we interact with him. Okay, I'm going to write a couple of uh, prepositional uh, phrases up on, the, up on the board for you that talk to us about how we pray. When we pray, generally, we should pray to the Father. It doesn't mean it's wrong to pray to Jesus, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but generally speaking, we should pray to the Father. Um, a couple of reasons why this is important. For you to understand that while praying to Jesus is not wrong, praying to the Father should be our primary way of praying. Um, here's how a lot of Christians think about God the Father, and hopefully none of you do, but I think it's very important that we clarify this point. Some people think of God the Father as like this big meanie who wants to judge us, right? And sometimes this is because some people have had a, a father, an earthly father, who wasn't very nice. So we think of God the Father as this big meanie who all he wants to do is judge people. But because Jesus is our Savior, Jesus of his own volition came to die on the cross so he could essentially protect us from the Father. And so we think of this, of the Father, we, hopefully you guys don't, but some people do, the Father as somebody who doesn't like people. And so Jesus kind of is, is our intermediary, our defender against the Father. Like imagine in some families... When a father's really mean, there might be an older brother or sister, an older sibling, who, when dad's really going after their younger sibling, they kind of get in the way and like, hey, hey, take it easy, you know? And sometimes we think of Jesus as like our older sibling, which he kind of is, because we're all children of God, but our older sibling who's like, take it easy, dad, give them a break. And it's so important that we understand that God, the Father, loves us and wants a relationship with us and calls us to pray to him. So the scripture I want to start with for this, just to, just to justify it, is uh, turning your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, and we're looking for verses 9 to 13. Now, Matthew 5, this is what is called the Sermon on the Mount. The best preacher in the history of the world preached this sermon. His name is Jesus. And as Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, he gives some instructions about how to pray. Now, some version of these instructions come in different Gospels. In, and, and, and it's like Jesus said the same thing more than once. In Luke chapter 11, which we're not going there, but, but if you want to put your thumb in there as a kind of a, a, a parallel, in Luke chapter 11 and verses 1 to 4, the disciples come to Jesus and he says, and they say, Lord, teach us how to pray. And Jesus gives them what is called the Lord's Prayer. But the reason I'm taking us to Matthew is because in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus also gives them the Lord's Prayer, and it's a little bit longer. Now we're going to, uh, we are going to talk about in more detail about some of the aspects of the Lord's Prayer, but for now what I want you to notice is that when Jesus says this then is how you should pray, what he's just been talking about is how the Pharisees and other people don't pray the right way. They, they pray trying to impress people. They stand in the synagogues. And they put their hands up, and, and not that putting your hands up in prayer is wrong, but, but in this case, when you're trying to show off, Jesus is saying some people, when they pray, they're showing off for other people. He says, don't be like them. Instead, uh, Jake, maybe you wanna, if, if you're there, do you think you can read that for me? Matthew 5, 9 to 13? Right in the right. That's not quite what I'm looking for. Maybe I have the, maybe I have the wrong uh, verses. Uh, I do five. Let, let me. Get, I'll get there. I don't know. Goodness, my my notes. I put it wrong in my notes. Give me just a moment. It's right in here. And it's, do, 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 so it can have it. Maybe it's. Oh, it's it's six. Six. Six nine to thirteen. Da 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 da. da. It's still in the context of Sermon on the Mount. I promise. It's an easy fix. One number off. All right, 
right, very good. So that's, that's the, that is what we sometimes call the Lord's Prayer. But we, wanna, we don't want um, to get too confused here. When we call it the Lord's Prayer, it's how the Lord said we should pray. He says this then is how you should pray. So it might be better called the Disciples' Prayer or the Christian's Prayer. Um, because as Christians, he tells us to pray this way. Uh, as far as I know, Jesus. So it is the Lord's Prayer. I'm not saying that's wrong, but the, re the only reason I mention that is he says, this then is how you should pray. And I don't think he means, not that this is wrong either, but I don't think he means you have to say these exact words. Um, I think, but, but the, he gives us an idea, and we'll talk more about that, like I said, later. This is an idea of the kinds of things you pray for. Right? You ask for your basic needs, and you, uh, you praise God. Hallowed be thy name is a way of saying that God is holy, and we, uh, we praise him. Oh, really? you, just, you think you can turn the heater on? I'm just noticing Holly is cold while we're, while we're at it. Go ahead. Okay, the prayer of Jabez, Holly is asking about. Um... The prayer of Jabez is, oh, I'd, I'd have to look it up exactly, but I believe it's in the early chapters of 1 Chronicles, like 1 Chronicles 6, something or other, or something like that. But the prayer of Jabez, Jabez, it, it, it's not a bad thing to think about. Jabez, we don't know a lot about him, but he asked God for some basic requests. And so, um, yeah. Yeah, I think he says, Lord, you know, oh, Lord, oh, uh, Oh, that you would bless me. I have it in the Old King James. Bless me indeed. Enlarge my boundaries. Uh, keep me from, right, keep me from evil that I might not be in offense. And the Lord granted it. So, yeah, your hand would be so, so a, a really good, another good example of prayer. Oh, Jabez, what, what it says in the Jabez prayer, it starts out Jabez. Jabez was more righteous than his brothers, and Jabez called on the God of Israel. So it, all it says, and then he said, oh, that you would bless me indeed. But Matthew 6, uh, 9 to 13, notice that Jesus begins the prayer with our Father. And that's what I'm focusing with on. Jesus says, this then is how you should pray our Father in heaven. The reason I mention this is because if Jesus said this is how you should pray, if you don't ever find yourself praying to God the Father, you're missing a lot. You're missing this incredible relationship with God the Father as your Father. God, through Jesus, calls us to pray to him. One of the things you have to understand is how much God the Father loves you. Um, we talked uh, at one point about um, uh, Romans, uh, Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That would be God the Father demonstrates his love toward us. Uh, think about 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. Our God, our Heavenly Father, loves us. He's not this... this divine branch waiting to throw lightning bolts at us he loves us he wants a relationship with us and if we ignore the father and we ignore the premise that we pray to the father we are missing so much in a full or trinitarian we might say relationship we can have go ahead while i'm writing well, you know how some people pray abba father uh-huh what does Abba mean? Okay, before I explain this next preposition, why don't we go to Romans chapter 8, which incidentally is my very favorite chapter in the entire Bible. Romans chapter 8. And uh, whether you should have favorite chapters in the Bible, I do, and mine is Romans 8. Now go to uh, Romans 8 and... Uh, Romans 8. 8, 14, and 15. This is talking about the relationship we have with God the Father. In fact, and I'm getting, I'm actually going to talk about this in a later, uh, in a later verse, so kind of keep your, keep this in your mind, because this is a verse we'll talk about a, a little bit later, but, uh, because this is going to, we're going to talk about this in the, the Holy Spirit part too, but we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll have a preview here. 
Uh, Romans 8, beginning in verse 14. Why don't you go ahead and read that, Holly? Romans 8, 14, and, uh, 14 to 16. By him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. We have received the spirit of sonship by which we call, cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with or even to our spirit that we are God's children. Abba is a Hebrew word that is transliterated here. The Greek word for father is pater. Uh, we, you know, we get words like patriarchy and others from that. So pater is the Greek word for father. So Abba pater is what it says. Abba is straight from Hebrew, and Abba is a intimate name for father. Some have made a comparison with the English word daddy, and if that's helpful for you, that works. Uh, others with the, with the English word papa, because when you say, there's nothing wrong with saying father, when you say papa, it almost communicates almost like a, a familial relationship. My, my dad called his father pop, right? And it kind of sounds a little, a little less formal. Like when we'd gone, when we went to visit my dad's father when I was a kid, if he'd been like, well, hello, father. You know, it might be like, okay, he's very formal with his father, but he's like, you know, hey, how's it going, Pop? By the way, just if you ever come with, to visit my family with me, my, my, my father's father is no longer with us, but uh, the Vic side of the family, not so much my mom's side of the family, all the men in the family talk really, really, really loud. Um, and uh, anyway, so, so I just want to, I want to give you guys fair warning. You might want to bring your, your earmuffs when you come to visit you know, to our family reunion or something, because everyone's kind of like, like, what seems like shouting for them. You guys probably feel like I talk loud, but I really try to tone it down. But, uh, you know, so my my dad would just see his father, and, hey, Pop, and that's like a term of endearment. It shows they have a relationship. And Abba is a way of talking about we are. God is not only our father in some theological sense. We, in, we enter into an intimate relationship with him a good analogy or a good a good visualization is imagine a uh, you know imagine a little baby girl maybe three or four years old crawling up into her daddy's lap you know and dad read me a story or something it's kind of like that kind of relationship that god wants us to have with himself he loves us and that's what romans 8 which i haven't written on the board is talking about how we have this intimate relationship and that that gets us ahead because You'll notice it talks about how we've received the spirit of adoption, and then it goes on about the spirit bearing witness with our spirit. We'll get to that in a minute, so I don't know. In your minds, don't get too far away from Romans 8. It's just that. I want to go in order of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit the way we usually talk, say it. So, we, we generally pray to the Father in the name of the Son. So when we say in Jesus' name, when we pray, we say that because that is what the Bible tells us we ought to do. Um, if, you were to, if you were to go do a word search on the words in and name in the Bible, you would find that we are always told to pray in Jesus' name. John chapter 14, and we're talking about almost like the whole chapter. You could go through this and see again and again, Jesus says, in my name, what you ask the Father, in my name. In fact, he says in, a, in 1413, he even says, I will do whatever you ask in my name. So Jesus even gives us an invitation that we can Pray to him. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But uh, all of these things in his name. So whoever we are, whoever we are praying to, when I say whoever we're praying to, to God, but whether we're praying to Jesus or whether we're praying to the Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. The reason we do that is because it's a way of us confessing that it is 
through Jesus that we have a relationship with God. Jesus has a Jesus has in a sense opened up the relationship we have with the Father. Um, we've talked when we we're talking about sin. We we're talking about what sin does is it causes separation, separation between us and God, and that's fundamentally what sin does. Is it, is it breaks a relationship between human beings and God? In his work on the cross, Jesus brought about what we talked about in our soteriology section, reconciliation. Jesus reconciled us to the Father. Through Christ, we have been reconciled to God. And when we say in Jesus' name or in the name of Jesus, we are right. We are honoring the fact that it is through the work of God the Son that we have been brought into a relationship with the Father. Let's, let's go to John 14 for a minute, and we'll just read a little bit of this. Just uh, such good stuff. If you've never made a real thorough study of John chapter 14, it is a wonderful, wonderful chapter. But I want to focus on the... Um, Let's just let's just read uh, verses chapter fourteen, and how about verses? Uh, yeah, we're gonna get to thirteen. Why don't uh, why don't we read starting in verse eleven, and we'll work our way we'll work our way all the way to verse uh, to verse fourteen. Um, okay, I'll I'll go ahead with this one. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe in the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will, have, will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to my Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, he doesn't specify that you have to ask him as in me. He's saying he'll do what we ask the Father in his name. And so, on a very fundamental and rudimentary basic level, that means that we pray in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, I pray. But you have to understand, too, that in this culture and in this world, somebody's name is representative of who they are. We, 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 use it, we even still talk about somebody having a good name. And having a good name doesn't mean like, I don't know, like if my name was Thor, I may be like, I like the name Thor, that would be a good name. That's not what we mean, you know, or Abraxas or something, you know, cool names, uh, Shondell. What we mean by a good name is uh, your character represented by your name. Like if I talk about, if you were to tell me, hey Pete, what is Claude Burnley like? I'd be like, man, he is such a fantastic guy, you know? He uh, he takes good care of his family. He, he, he serves the church. He does all these wonderful things. I don't mean to embarrass you, brother, but uh, Claude's gonna turn red on me again. But uh, <laughs> which is, <laughs> we were having a joke about that the other night. But uh, but um, anyway, but you know, like I, I, I would talk about his character if you ask me what Claude is like. I wouldn't say, oh, well, you know, his name is spelled C L A U D E, you know, space B U R N L E Y. And so when Jesus says in my name, this is this is important because we could confuse these things he says about like their blank checks, right? Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Man, maybe if I ask God for that, for, you know, God, I'd, in Jesus' name, I would really like to drive a Porsche, right? Ferrari. Ferrari, there we go. That's not what it's talking about. Sorry, guys. It's not talking about you can get anything you want. All you have to do is use that like a magic trick in Jesus' name. It means consistent with his character and who he is. And his ultimate goal is the salvation of the lost, the building up of the kingdom of God, etc. And we're going to talk about this more in another part of the study. So these, what, what, what some people have misunderstood to be kind of like blank check prayers, they have to do with things that are consistent with the will and purposes of God. But I have good news that I'll tell you in a sec. What, what, go ahead with the question, Holly. Um, 
It has to be in accordance to his will. Yes, in accordance to his will is, is something that goes along with in his name. What I can say about good news is that if you have loved ones who don't know the Lord and you pray for them, we understand that there is a human response involved in here and there can be unbelief and hardness of the heart. However, we also, one, of the things, one of the things we're going to learn about praying is praying for the lost to get saved. That's consistent with who Jesus is and the will of God. So, so that's a prayer that, if, that I believe that God would very much want to answer if we pray if we pray that God would bless our church by giving us golden walls I don't think he's going to answer that right and we're like oh God we want one of those great big huge stadium style churches where we can have the, the awesome lights and maybe the you know I don't know I don't think God cares about that but if we pray for God to bless our church because what we really care about is loving the lost caring for the poor, things like that. I think these are sort of the things that if we pray about, God is very interested in answering these prayers because they are consistent with his will and who he is. So praying in the name of Jesus means we're praying consistent with his will and his work. And we pray one more prepositional phrase. Prepositions are words like to, in, and by. By the, anyone want to guess? Excellent. And I'll just go ahead and put the adjective on here so we make sure we know who we're talking about. By the Holy Spirit. So we pray to the Father in the name of the Son and by the Holy Spirit. And by the Holy Spirit means that so here's a word that we often use in conjunction with the Holy Spirit, quite correctly. The Holy Spirit empowers us to do the will of God. And one of the ways he empowers us is in our prayer life. The Holy Spirit, through, through his rec the reconciliation he gave us, Jesus gave us a relationship. He connected us with God. But the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, functions as a kind of a channel in our relationship with the Father. Our connection with God is maintained through his Holy Spirit living in us. So the Holy Spirit reveals to us the will of God, helps us to pray in the way we ought to, helps us communicate to God as we should, and just all around us, all around facilitates this relationship we have. I want to go back again to Romans 8 that we talked about, um, where it says, I'm just going to read it again. Holly already read it, but I'm going to read it again because it's that good. And we were listening for the Father, right? We were talking about Abba Father. This time, think about the Spirit. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading again to fear, but rather the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. A couple of things it tells us the Spirit does. The Spirit helps us understand our relationship with God. It says we have not received a spirit of fear. People who are terrified of God the Father and think they need to hide behind God the Son, they need to get in tune with the Holy Spirit in their prayer life so he can help them understand they don't need to be afraid. It is the Spirit who helps us to understand this wonderful, intimate relationship summarized in the words, Abba, Father. He testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. This is a way of saying he reminds us who we are are in relation to God the Father. He reminds us that we are God the Father's children. In a, in, yeah, so so I do want to I do want to throw that out because absolutely he is. Uh Holly said Jesus basically Jesus is our brother. And I think that's an excellent, that's, that's one of the ways we can talk about our relationship to Jesus. And let me, let me read a little further in Romans 8. That was on my notes, so let me get back there in my Bible to, to, to flesh that out a little bit. So 
So the Holy Spirit helps us understand our relationship to God, and yes, in a very, very real sense, Jesus is our brother. So I was at 16, and listen to what it says in 17. Okay, 16 again. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs with heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings, that we may also share in his glory. Joint heirs, or some translations say co-heirs. So Jesus is, Jesus is sometimes called the firstborn, and some people misunderstand what that means. They think, oh, that means that Jesus had a beginning. Jesus didn't have a beginning. He's been God the Son from all eternity. The reason he's called the firstborn is because in ancient cultures, in the in the world, in like uh, in Jewish culture, in ancient Israel, but in ancient Greece and ancient Rome also, the firstborn son was kind of like top dog. He inherited the father's estate, and he kind of took over the family management. He was the main inheritor, and so when Jesus is the firstborn, it's like he is saying that. In the family of God, he is, he is, you know, kind of the son of God par excellence. He's the preeminent one. He's the, he's the greatest of them all, you might say. But here is the grace of God the Father and the, the grace of God the Son to us. As the firstborn, Jesus has rights to all inheritance. But when it says we are joint heirs, he shares it with us. Now, this inheritance is talking about heaven, eternal glory, dwelling forever with God the Father, with God the Son, and with God the Holy Spirit. And Jesus makes that possible because through, through um, his death on the cross, God glorified him. That's actually talking about the name of Jesus. I know we're going all over the place. But turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2 for a minute. This was not part of my scripted teaching, but it goes right along with what Holly's saying and, and with what we share. Okay. Um, Philippians 2 5 and following says this Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. Yet he made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to, the to, to death, even death on a cross. So let's talk about Jesus becoming a man and dying on a cross, humbling himself in that way. But if we keep reading, it goes on to say, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that and the, at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The work of Jesus gives him this name above all other names and ultimately glorifies God. But what did Romans 8 say? If we suffer with him, we will also be glorified with him. So in Jesus being glorified because of what he did on the cross, when we follow him faithfully, we share in his glory in the next life. Go ahead, Holly. Question. Where was that? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I blame myself. Philippians 2 and uh, 5 to 11. If you're not familiar with Philippians chapter 2, spend some time in that one. I read 5 to 11, but start reading in verse 1 to 11. It talks about all these wonderful things about how we should live, how we should treat each other, right? Um, you know, uh, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not look out only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. He says all that, and he's like, why should you do that? Because that's what Jesus did. And when we do that, we share in his glory. One more verse about praying by the Holy Spirit, and so... I know we're dancing around a lot, but there's just so much good Bible about this stuff. That is good Bible. Uh, Ephesians 2.8. 
is one more verb I want to focus on just a little bit here. See if I have room down here. And Ephesians 2 8. Did I say 2 8? I think I meant, I, I really need to update. Ephesians 2.8 is a wonderful, wonderful verse, but what I meant was 18. Ephesians 2.8 is such an important verse. i got I, I to edit my notes. Ephesians 2.18, another important and wonderful verse. Uh, through him, in him there would be Jesus, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Now, both there means Jewish people and Gentiles, which means everybody who's not a Jew. Jewish people and Gentiles both have access to God the Father by one Spirit. That would be by the Holy Spirit. The relation of this to prayer and by the Spirit is our access to God the Father is talking Fundamentally, not, not necessarily the only thing, but our fu fundamentally it's talking about how because we've been saved, we now can communicate to him in our prayer lives. In the Old Testament period, maybe you guys have noticed this, but if not, if you read your Old Testament, here's something you find. There's all these priests and stuff. You ever notice that? The Levites... They, 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 they serve in the temple and you offer sacrifices. You have to uh, you have to have a priest to offer the sacrifice for you in the Old Testament. And there's this room in the temple called the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest is allowed to go in there and kind of communicate with God. But one of the things, and, and there's a really thick veil separating the rest of the temple from the Holy of Holies. After Jesus rose from the dead, that veil ripped right down the middle. That really happened in the temple, but it was a symbolic thing God did to tell us that now everybody, through Christ and by the Holy Spirit, has direct access to God the Father. We don't need priests anymore. That's why... That's why they call me a pastor, not a priest. Because we're all priests now. God has made us all priests. The Bible says he's made us a kingdom of priests, which means that you and I can bring our requests directly to God the Father. But it's not like a holy man, like, uh, you know, Mr. Mr. Priest, you know, your eminence. Can you pray for me? Can you pray to God for me? Because uh, I'm not important enough, and I don't know if he's going to listen to me. If you're a believer in Jesus, a son and heir of God the Father, you have direct access to God the Father and can pray to him any time, and the Holy Spirit communicates your rough prayer request to God. What does confession mean? Confession? Confession in, oh, 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 in a Roman Catholic context. With respect to any Roman Catholic brothers and sisters who might be listening, it's wrong. <laughs> Here's what I mean. What I mean is in confession in a Roman Catholic context, and again, I'm not trying to bash on anyone, I'm just being honest. You go to this little booth, and you confess your sins to the priest, and then he tells you these things you have to do to make up for your sins. They call it penance, right? You know, drink some holy water. I don't think they really drink it. But, you know, say a few Hail Marys, and, and, and you're all good. Now, but because we have direct access to God the Father, confession... Biblical confession means when you when you know you have sin in your life, you bring it to God. God, I admit this sin. Please forgive me for it. Please help me to do better. First uh, John one nine. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous, forgiving our sins and cleansing us of all unrighteousness. There's no ceremony. There's no there's no booth. There's no penance, because Jesus took the punishment for the sin on the cross, right? You and God confess your sins, he forgives you, he cleanses you immediately, and then you, you recommit yourself to a life of obedience. Is that why in the Jewish people they didn't drink the 
in part, but chief cornerstone also. Okay, what is the chief cornerstone? Yeah, I love this Bible study. Let me, uh, so this is a little bit of an, let me say one, one final thing about prayer and then we'll, and then I'll talk chief cornerstone. We got a little bit of time and we'll take it. Um, I just want to kind of summarize something about prayer. Now, what I'm not saying is that it is, it is wrong to ever pray to Jesus. And in the Bible, we have examples of people praying to the Father. We have examples of praying to Jesus. In the Bible, we don't have an example of someone praying to the Holy Spirit, but I'm not even saying that's wrong. The Holy Spirit is fully God, and there's no reason you can't pray to the Holy Spirit that I know of. However, the general pattern, the the way Jesus told us to pray, I guess I might say most of the time, would be to the Father. When we put all this together, we should be praying to the Father in the name of the Son and recognizing that in this process when we come before God the Father in prayer, the Holy Spirit is working in our lives to communicate our request to the Father, communicate the Father's love and will to us. And so the doctrine of the Trinity is the, the basis and foundation for your prayer life. So I need to erase all of this now because I, I'm going to get into that business about the chief cornerstone. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful... I know I keep using the word wonderful. We're talking about the Bible, and I'm a fan. Uh, Holly, the cornerstone is, uh, we get this from, I believe, Ephesians chapter 4. Let me see if I have this right. Yeah. Or is it, or is it chapter 2? Maybe it's 2. Chapter 2. Thank you. 20. Yeah, 2 and 4, they're both good. So, yeah, Ephesians 2, 20. So let me, let's just look at that in a little bit of context. For he himself, that would be Jesus, I'm, in two, I'm going to start in 2.14. He himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of two, thus making peace. The two there again is Jewish people and Gentiles. He's brought them together. Um, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to those who were far away and to those who were near, so that through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens of God's people, members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being dwelt together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. One of the reasons we don't have a temple in the New Testament or New Covenant period is because the people of God are the temple. As God brings us to spiritual maturity, we are the temple. And that so so God is using a metaphor of the church, not years ago we did a study called What is Church? And one of the things, first things we learned is the church is not the building. The church is the people. We are the church, right? And there's two dimensions to church. One is the church universal, all believers throughout the world. Then there are local churches, one of which is high point. The emphasis here is all believers, what God is doing. And he talks about how the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. That's talking about the apostles in the first generation, Peter and Paul and, you know, Thomas and all the others, the 12 apostles, 13 when you include Paul, and other prophets in that same generation. And we know it's talking about prophets in that generation because they're part of the foundation. A and P here stands for apostles and prophets. So in that first generation, as the New Testament was being written, these apostles and prophets are laying the foundation of the church. But pardon me for my abbreviation here, but JC, I don't usually like to do this, stands for Jesus Christ. He is the chief cornerstone. The cornerstone was the most important part of a foundation in those days. 
they didn't have the same, uh, they didn't build buildings the same way we do now, but most, most buildings were built on a kind of a stone foundation. And the most important stone, the first one they put down was the cornerstone. And the cornerstone on, on which you build the rest of the foundation is the most important part. So, the church, the people of God, which is metaphorically speaking a holy temple, we are being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus as the chief cornerstone. Now, I'm going to draw this as, as if it looks like a modern-day church building, sort of, even though that's not you know, necessarily what, you know, what this is about. But let's just say this is, let's just say metaphorically this represents the people of God, the church. You and me and every believer throughout the history of the church is this, and God is building his kingdom through the church in the current age, and all of this, the foundation for all of this was laid in the days when Jesus was alive and when the apostles and early prophets were alive and laid this foundation. Part of that is that the apostles and prophets, some of them, wrote books in the New Testament to give us our foundation for the Christian faith. And through that, and through the work of the Holy Spirit, as we love one another and seek to know Christ, God's church is being built. So I'm going to I'm going to emphasize I'm going to emphasize the sort of. So here, so so the question was that the United States was built on the on a Christian foundation because of the founding fathers, and Holly said sort of, and sort of is the operative word because one of the things you have to understand, Holly, is that most of the founding fathers were not what you would call an evangelical Christian. A few of them were, like John Jay, but most of the founding fathers were what 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 is called a Deist. And a deist is someone who believes in God, but not necessarily Jesus. In those days, they didn't really have a whole lot of atheists, and they didn't really, and they didn't have this. Charles Darwin hadn't really come out with his evolutionary scheme for how the world came into being, so everybody assumed there had to be a God that created the world. But Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, George Washington, most of these guys, they didn't believe you got saved through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They believed in a God, and they believed in what we might call Christian morality. Don't lie, don't steal, don't kill, that sort of thing, the Ten Commandments. Benjamin Franklin, these people didn't believe in Jesus. I just want to be really clear. They, they believed that there was a man named Jesus. They were not evangelical Christians the way we think about it. So if we say that America was founded as a Christian nation, we have to give that a small c. It was founded on Christian morality, but it was not founded on, like, Jesus Christ is the only way to God, because most of those guys didn't believe that. What happened is, uh, in the history of America, there were a bunch of Christian revivals where tons and tons of people became Christian. See, when you have, when you determine, when you determine who your political officers are by a vote, generally speaking, People want to vote for the people who they think believe things closest to them. If more people are Christians in a, in, a, in a democratic situation or a Republican kind of government, they're more likely to vote for people who, are, who they think are more consistent with Christian values. So we kind of so so for a long time, Christians kind of had a lot of voting power because there were so many Christians because of these revivals. But it's really important we understand George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson. Benjamin Franklin, they didn't believe they didn't believe in salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ, but they did believe in the Ten Commandments and stuff like that. Um, the reason this is important is because what it tells us is when Christianity gained more influence in the nation, it was because people got saved. You're, if you if you haven't, I, I love the United States Constitution, but if you haven't read the United States Constitution, read it. And here's what you'll find. You'll find a lot of talk about the Creator. We are endowed from our Creator with our, by our Creator with certain in, in, inalienable rights. Said that wrong, but you get the idea. You ain't gonna find Jesus mentioned one time in the Constitution. You ain't gonna find the Holy Spirit mentioned. You ain't gonna find the Bible mentioned. 
So they believed in a God, but to say that America was founded as a Christian nation, not quite. So when a bunch of people got saved in the revivals, the nation got closer to God because people got saved. As Christians kind of slacked off with sharing the gospel with people, we got less people getting saved, we got less Christians, and the voting population isn't voting for stuff that is consistent with Christianity. And what did the Christians do? A lot of them were like, ah, we got to figure out how to get people to vote for the right person. A much better approach is sharing the gospel so people get saved. <laughs> and then the more people get saved, the more Christian nation will be because more of the citizens will know Christ as Savior. So we got away, we got away from being a nation that honors God. There were always problems. I mean, I don't want to say, but 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 in, in in any way, in any way that the nation's gotten away from being a nation that honors God, it's because we got less Christians in it. And the only way we're gonna get back there, if back there is the right way to say it, is by getting more people saved. This is why at High Point we're talking about prayer, or among other things, revival. Well, <laughs> you can't change the way people live without them getting to know Jesus. You can't change people's values without them coming to faith in Christ. It doesn't work like that. That's why that whole bit about accept a man be born again. Kind of a rabbit trail, but, you know, so this is why, Holly, we're going to pray that God will pay our bills. We're going to pray that God will heal our sicknesses. But we're also going to pray that God will give us revival and people will get saved. And, uh, yeah, millions and millions and millions of saved people will give us a Christian nation. Millions and millions and millions of people who don't know the Lord will give us something else oh <laughs> how did these prosperity people pop up such good questions um I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this the last one for tonight so write them down for next week but uh basically so prosperity theology is a false teaching a heresy that says that god's goal is for you to be rich for all of us to be rich and prosperous. The prosperity preachers cropped up because what they realized is, one, they wanted to have a lot of money. And so they realized that other people out there are just like them, and they want to have a lot of money. And these preachers found out that if I preach this message that God wants to make you rich, and so the way you're gonna get rich is by giving money to my ministry, God's going to multiply that, then God's going to make you rich. So the sow a seed promise, you know, sow a seed to our ministry by putting your credit card number in your, you know, the right thing or whatever, or in the old days of checks, you know, send your check to our ministry. And so it was very successful in making the preachers really, really rich. Because all these nice little old ladies are, are, are giving them their pension checks and whatever. So what prosperity theology does is it gives you a few really, really, really rich preachers and then a bunch of, bunch of very, very, very poor Christians who are hoping that someday if they send one more check, they're going to get rich. Uh, if you're going to be a preacher, God didn't call you to become rich. It doesn't mean it's wrong to make a living or whatever, but, 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 but if you think you're going to get rich by preaching your... Uh, if, your goal, if your goal in preaching is to get rich, you're doing the devil's work. Because God said, Jesus said, you cannot love, you cannot serve God and money. Doesn't mean it's wrong to have money. I've got a little on the cookie jar on top of my fridge. No, I'm just kidding. But doesn't mean it's wrong to have any money ever. But if you're living to serve money, if your goal in life is to have money, your main goal at least, you ain't serving God. You're serving money. That's a good question. If, I'm, if I sound hard on those guys, I, 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 I can't, there, there's a few groups out there that I'm really hard on. 
not very many, but one of them is these prosperity preachers because they are basically stealing from people and saying it's God doing it. And they're wearing gold watches while people are starving and got use for it. But on that happy note, <laughs> Father, we love you. We ask that even as the disciples asked Jesus and as we talked about earlier, you will teach us to pray. I thank you so much for our group and for these wonderful questions. And I pray that you will just be magnified and glorified through our study. Help us to have the heart of Christ and the heart, your heart. Where, Lord, while we do need our our day-to-day needs to be provided for, and we thank you for our provision, even as Jesus prayed, give us today our daily bread. At the same time, Lord, the greater things on your heart are the state of the world, and primarily the state of a world in unbelief who desperately needs to know the love of God that can only be found through Jesus Christ. And we pray that our prayer lives will just be saturated with love for the lost. We give you all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen? All right. Yeah, that was a, just had some, some 